Welcome to lecture 33, the final lecture in the arts and literature uh, stream of the course. And I'll be trying to pull together several threads today, uh, looking particularly at the quick question of what the arts bring to the question of perspective, how to use a word we uh, introduced at the beginning of the course, how art can defamiliarize uh, us and allow us to see environmental relations anew. And the setting of today's lecture is the seafloor. And I want to approach the seafloor from three perspectives. I want to think about it as a space of, um, as a biological space, firstly. We'll be talking about coral reefs and algae. The seafloor also, though, as a political space, uh, a space of drowning migrants and rising water. And third, the seafloor as a theatrical space, a performance space, a stage that these artists use for dramatizing stories. So the artist I'll be focusing on most uh, in most detail today is uh, Jason Dequeres Taylor, a sculptor and performance artist. And what he made a very helpful statement about what he sees in the seafloor as a medium. So he says the submerged perspective um, allows, of, of the submerged perspective, he says, the experience of being underwater is vastly different from that of being on land. Objects appear 25% larger underwater and closer. Colors alter as light is absorbed and reflected at different rates with the depth of the water affecting this further. The light produces kaleidoscopic effects governed by water movement, currents, and turbulence. Water is a malleable medium in which, travel, in which to travel. Your senses are much more immersed underwater, but you can also have a more detached consciousness like a form of meditation, okay? Uh, and so this idea of the light, all the light coming from above, it's not a terrest typical terrestrial experience. The, the, the um, shift in how far or, or, or intimate uh, thing objects look, uh, th these, these shifts in perspective are, allow the artist to explore um, new ways of seeing uh, the, the immersive environment. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, the underwater activism and think about um, a, a video that went viral just before the Copenhagen Climate Summit, um, put together by Mohamed Nasheed, who was then the president of the Maldives, which was, uh, is a low-lying archipelago in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the highest point in the archipelago is, I think, seven feet. So he made this uh, sort of um, darkly comic and um, very, very effective video in which he envisaged a cabinet meeting in the year 2050, uh, once the island nation had vanished beneath the sea. Uh, and you can see with the, the way that the, the, the underwater currents pull the hair up, there's a kind of a gothic uh aspect to this the spectacle and what it is is uh he's called together his cabinet meeting on the floor uh sea floor and together the cabinet is witnessing him signing a commitment to be carbon neutral by the year 2030. um so if we think about uh, what's what's going on in in the series of images uh, one of the things that he's, he's trying to do is he's trying to amplify two forms of invisibility or to counter two forms of invisibility. Uh, the invisibility of his tiny nation state, which has very little uh, traction on the global stage. Uh, you know, most people don't know much about the Maldives. Uh, and secondly, uh, the invisibility of um, the the, the long durée of slow violence, of the, the, the gradual disappearance of this island nation as it's subsumed um, by, by the rising waters. And very much to the forefront of his thinking was the question of um, 
the fate of uh, predominantly brown and black nations, previously colonized nations, in relation to the richer nations of the North. Um, so uh, he, the, he, he's very much speaking to the metaphors of swamping, inundation, drowning, that we, we uh, recur in relation to the history of immigration. And so if we go back to uh, The Great Gatsby, 1925, um, this, is a, this is a quote. Civilization's going to pieces. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empire by this man, Goddard? The idea is if we don't look out for the white race, we'll, we'll be utterly submerged, okay? So Tom, the character Tom Buchanan in The Great Gatsby here is using a watery metaphor, the, the idea of being submerged by uh, um, non-white immigrants. And the book that Buchanan is referring to is a book from the 1920s called The Rising Tide of Color, The Threat Against White World Supremacy. Okay, and so the Stoddard um, was was creating a kind of a moral panic around um, uh, immigration in particular, and the peril of what he talked about as the eventual submersion beneath of of white America beneath vast waves of yellow men, brown men, black men, and red men, whom the Nordics have hitherto dominated. Okay, so. Uh, he you know, started was a notorious eugenicist and anti-immigrant campaigner. But what interests me here is this question of um, the dead metaphors coming to life. Uh, this metaphoric matrix continues to be used by politicians. He has a British politician saying British towns are being swamped by immigrants and the inhabitants are under siege. So what Muhammad Nasheed is doing is he is um, taking this metaphor of uh, a sort of white, a white panic around uh, non-white immigration. Uh, and he's uh, situating it in relation to the climate justice movement, okay? Um, and so what you have here is an image of reverse inundation not uh, brown and black immigrants uh, putatively uh, uh, inundating or swamping the richer nations, but uh, a, a scenario where he's dramatizing carbon colonialism, where the, the world's most vulnerable populations in, in places like the small islands of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, um, are, are being endangered, are being imperiled by the, um, the carbon legacy in the atmosphere put there um, by the rich and, richer nations. Um, and we notice in the background the Maldives flag. We typically associate flags with uh, high points, uh, peaks of mountains or uh, on top of buildings or flagpoles. Here, the, the flag itself, uh, symbolizing the nation, um, is uh, invisible from the surface, uh, but planted on the, um, uh, on the sea floor as a kind of inversion of, of normal, uh, the normal life. Now, just 18 months before um, Mohammed Nasheed made this video, there was another flag planted on the seafloor, and this was by a Russian submersible. And the submersible planted the flag on the Arctic sea shelf. And this was a provocative move by the Russians. Uh, and the, the Russian uh, expedition organizers said the Arctic is Russian. Okay, so it was a land claim. And the reason why this land claim was being made was, um, as many of you may know, the melting of the sea ice was opening up new uh, channels of uh, new sea lanes and also opening up the prospect of new rounds of um, extractivism, of, of, of drilling for oil and gas and minerals. 
And so I want to think us to think about these two flags uh, in combination. Uh, and if we, if, we, if, we, if we pair them, we can see them as in a way, uh, not, uh, not, no pun intended, carbon copies of each other. On the top left, we have business as usual, um, the a new round of carbon colonialism uh, taking place. On the bottom right, you have the fallout um, of that carbon colonialism with the, the disappearance of an island nation. So I want to move to the second part of the lecture, the raft of Lampedusa and other immigrant stories. So all of you will be aware of the, uh, the calamitous drownings of African and Middle Eastern um, refugees and migrants crossing the Mediterranean uh, from, from Turkey, from Tunisia, from uh, uh, Libya in particular. <clears throat> And so you have these scenarios like this one on the Greek island of Kos, where you have this, this, this very uh, intense juxtaposition of a culture of leisure and the, the, the uh, desperation of the refugees. We see this again in this image also from Kos, we have kite surfers in the background and abandoned life jackets. Life jackets abandoned by the refugees uh, in the foreground. And so we have this um, sort of very graphic juxtaposition of disparity uh, between leisure and, and survival. So one point of reference for several of these artists was a, a famous painting, French painting, called The Raft of the Medusa. And uh, a, a large number of French uh, immigrants uh, boarded the Medusa from France to Senegal in 1816, uh, were hit by calamitous storms, and were uh, the, the, the ship sank, and they were drifting around the West African coast. Um, on this raft, and I think uh, something like 132 people died. So the raft of the Medusa became a reference point for um, another French artist, Pierre Delavie. Um, and what he did was he took a photograph of a notorious crash of an immigrant vessel uh, off the Italian coast. And he turned this into a painting. Uh, 36 people died in this particular crash, um, but it became emblematic of uh, this desperation and abandonment. Uh, similarly, Jason de Keres Taylor also, um, uh, in this case, made a sculpture called the Raft of Lampedusa, um, echoing the Raft of Medusa from the 19th century. And we see here uh, a, a party of one of his, uh, a, a party of refugees who have sunk to the ocean bottom. <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to talk about today is um, the, the use of life on the seashore uh, to create a kind of collaborative art so that, that corals and algae and other living forms colonize his statuary, uh, De Keres Taylor's statuary, and become kind of collaborators in the aesthetic and political effect of the art. Here's another one of him, his works uh, of, of peripatetic migrants on the seafloor. Um, in, in a number of his pieces, uh, he uses the figure of the uh, snorkeler to create a sense of distance, a sort of an otherworldly distance between uh, the recreational diver, the gaze of the diver, and the, the immigrants who uh, belong to a kind of imaginative elsewhere, the, these anonymous uh, immigrants who are um, abandoned on their vessels. 
Here we have um, the idea of the immigrants uh, as, as both ordinary, uh, participating in, in social media, and somehow faceless. Uh, this is a, a kind of an image of, of uh, a selfie, uh, Facebook, faceless book, you might say, um, uh, that, that, that walks a line between um, making these people ordinary and also um, addressing their anonymity, uh, the fact that there are, there are data points, there are numbers, uh, they, they have in some sense been defaced by the, the awareness of the society. Another uh, artist, uh, Isaac Cordell, uh, produced a, a kind of a complementary um, image, which is uh, of politicians discussing global warming. And so what you have is a homogeneous group of, of white male politicians backs turned to the against the wider world, um, continuing the conversation, the hot air of prevarication, while uh, um, ignoring the rising waters the, around them. Uh, and so this sets up a tension between the surface voices of the politicians and the voices of those who drown, the, those who are exiled to the deep. This is a maritime sculpture by Maggie Hamlin, who's a, a British artist called The Scallop. And she, the, the quote inscribed in the top of this metal sculpture is from uh, the famous coastal opera, Peter Grimes by Benjamin Britten. And the words are, I hear those voices that will not be drowned. And so her artwork is a summons for strategic witnessing, um, a, a call for a, a deep kind of listening that can lend itself to testimonial cre creativity. Uh, and so the invitation is to amplify submerged voices that rise up against what Edward Said has called undocumented turbulence. I want to move in this third section to an ingenious uh, series uh, of images by uh, Jason DeCaris Taylor. And these images are set uh, in, on the River Thames in London. Uh, and it's called, the series is called The Rising Tide. Uh, and so Jason DeCaris Taylor uses the river this tidal river, the Thames, as a collaborator in the artwork um, to suggest the threat to low-lying cities from sea level rise. And London is one such threatened city. Uh, and the, the waters of the Thames uh, at, uh, at, at the point where it, they, they meet London uh, are, are extremely tidal. The, the, the distance between high and low tides is quite uh, dramatic. And so the statues don't move, um, but the water does. And so at this point, we have a sense of the horses as uh, drinking, cooling off in the river. It's a calm, controlled image. But as the tide shifts, you have a growing sense of peril, of, of inundation. And by the time you get to the high water mark, you can sense um, a, 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 a turn in the mood of the statuary corresponding to the, the onset of the incremental threat of rising waters. Part four, foreshadowed futures, historical hauntings. The Atlantic, as Elizabeth Delofrey has called it, is an unmarked grave. Uh, and so as I read it, these images of uh, Decaris Taylor are connecting the present loss of life 
to the sea bottom with the fate of drowned enslaved Africans um, uh, historically uh, um, being shipped from Africa to the Americas. Uh, and so there's a, there's a double reference here to the contemporary drowned refugees fleeing warfare and climate chaos, and the deeper history of, uh, of, of peril faced uh, by the enslaved uh, Africans. The Nobel Peace Prize, uh, the Nobel uh, Literary Laureate, Derek Walcott, uh, wrote this in his poem, The Schooner Flight. The Caribbean so choke with the dead, them corals, brain, fire, sea fans, dead men's fingers, and then the dead men. I saw that the powdery sand was their bones, ground white from Senegal to San Salvador. So what we sense here is the incorporation of the dead into the, the chemistry and the geology of the, the, the sea floor. Uh, the, uh, in the, the, the seafloor, which is also a graveyard. And we also see something else, <clears throat> the way that the corals are anthropomorphized, are seen in human terms, brain corals, sea fans, dead men's fingers. Um, so, Over the course of his, his, his uh, series of uh, deep sea sculptures, um, the Keras reimagines both the present and the future. And this to me is a, is a particularly powerful image of do not touch, um, as if the sculpture were in a museum, you know, it's, a, it's a standard uh, instruction in museums, do not touch the art. Um, but he's also, in a sense, uh, untouchable. He's an outcast, uh, an abandoned figure, kneeling, imploring, uh, with a scent, scent, uh, sense of him set apart from the, from, from the congregants uh, beyond. Here, again, we have the sense of the the coral and the algae as collaborators, uh, as the as the um, seafloor life forms occupy or colonize the statue, the man's body acquires an aura of antiquity. It speaks of the past of people dispatched or abandoned to the ocean depths. Uh, this ambiguous figure uh, is asleep, drowned in sleep, awash with sleep, one might say. Um, and, and as part of his project, the Keres Taylor's project of, of memory transformation. Um, here we have a Mount Rushmore like um, uh, set of faces, except that these are not the famous, these are the anonymous, the anonymous dead who uh, are being memorialized, the unnamed dead who have entered the annals of the sea floor. So the seabed, um, obviously that's a dead metaphor itself, the seabed becomes their final resting place. And here again, we see uh, De Keres Taylor using the figure of the scuba diver, the tourist, um, uh, to create a, a contrast, which is both temporal and also almost like um, the, the, the scuba diver or the snorkeler is coming from a different realm. The solace of tenderness on the march to where exactly, we don't know, the quest for, for, for hope and for life beyond. Um, again, we have the scuba diver uh, figure in the background, the march of humanity, um, of people um, uprooted by climate chaos and militarization, all trudging in the same direction. Um, and the image here, and 
uh, draws on the the heavy sensation of walking underwater. I'm sure many of you recall that you know when you try to walk underwater, it it uh, it, it it you've got a lot of you're facing a lot of resistance, and so I think that that um, the the figures walking against the water um, sort of helps convey the political heaviness of their plight. Um, here we have a sense of uh, the narrow portal, the gates and walls through which the immigrants are trying to pass towards a, a dreamt of future. The lost correspondent uh, here, Taylor is using the sandstorm, the sort of under uh, uh, the, the, the disturbed sand on the seafloor to create a kind of aura of, of obscurity. And this is the scribe of history bearing witness on a, an obsolete typewriter. This is also from another version of the lost correspondent. We talked in the second lecture a lot about the Anthropocene and I wanted to um, visit the Keres Taylor's sculptures about the Anthropocene from his Anthropocene series. And at the center of it is this uh, Volkswagen Beetle. And the figure, there's a figure on the windshield uh, who is ambiguous. Uh, is, is he sleeping? Is he coiled in a fetal position of fear? Um, is he dead? Uh, was, was there a collision of some kind? Uh, and so here Taylor rises to the challenge of humanizing the inhuman time frame of geology, creating memories of tomorrow, foreshadowing the aftermath of our high intensity carbon era. Um, this is a scene of petrification of being turned into stone. And the, the etymologically, the root word of, of petrify is um, it, it's both being turned to stone and being terrified. And it's the same root as the, the word petrol, which is the British word for, for gasoline. Okay, they all have the same uh, uh, root of being, of being uh, of being turned into, into stone in a sense, okay? Uh, so we have the link between fossil fuel and the fossilized posture of carbon era man. Uh, and so one, one of the possible readings of this is somebody sort of asleep through the carbon catastrophe, a kind of fetal sleep, uh, or is he the casualty of a, a slow motion collision the collision between Earth's life systems and uh, high intensity carbon uh, colonialism. And I think the reference in, in um, this, this image, the this sculpture, the reference is to quite explicitly to Pompeii, to that extraordinary explosion at Vesuvius that captured ordinary life, people sleeping, people climbing a ladder, people um, fishing, they were held by the, the volcanic uh, lava in these postures um, of everyday activity. And here I think uh, Taylor uses the uh, snorkelers to particularly powerful effect so that the light only comes from above, so the light is behind them, and they have an otherworldly feel. They're almost like angelic figures from a different realm. As a result, the distance between the divers and the, the, the man and the car is not only a physical distance, but a temporal distance. It's almost like the divers are visitors from some future time looking back on uh, the era of the automobile and high intensity carbon 
civilization. Uh, and the, this scene in particular reminded me of a passage in, from Walter Benjamin's Theses on the Philosophy of History. Uh, I should say that Walter Benjamin was a, a Jewish refugee who, flew, who, who, who fled the Nazis and died in Spain in 1940. And shortly before then, he had written a critique of the linear model of history as civilizational progress. As he put it, where we perceive a chain of events, the angel of history sees one single catastrophe that keeps piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. So in this sense, this, the, these figures, I'll, I, I read these figures as sort of angels of progress being blown backwards into the future as they watch the rubble of the present unfold. So I want to turn in the following section to novel ecologies and choral creativity. So I think one of the ingenious dimensions to de Kerestella's work is his embrace of choral as a creative partner. So he places these statues on the seafloor, and then the life forms, particularly the coral and algae, overtake these uh, statues and turn them into something else entirely. Shakespeare wrote in his final play, Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. I see the Kerestela's work as a sea change of this kind of uh, metamorphosis into something uh, that uh, exists beyond the intent of the artist, because the artist cannot know what the other species uh, down on the seafloor are going to do with the art, how they're going to respond and, in a sense, contribute to the artwork. So why does he, why is he drawn particularly to coral uh, as a subject and also as a medium? Coral offers the artist a, a, a palette of very vivid colors, uh, immense formal variety, textual range, an underworld aura, uh, the focus play of light from one direction only above, and also dynamism, process, interplay between human and non-human artistry. So coral, uh, the presence of coral in these statues complicates the divide between human and non-human agency and the divide between the living and the dead. Uh, the statues are in some sense lifeless, um, but they're then encrusted in life uh, that continues to transform them. Coral reefs are ecosystems in the front lines of the fallout from accelerating anthropogenic pl planetary change. Uh, we're vulnerable to warming, uh, the coral is vulnerable to warming, to acidifying oceans, to toxic runoff, and to invasive species. So coral reefs are, are very important as kind of natural uh, barriers. They serve as natural ramparts that can lessen the impact of storm surge and sea level rise compounded by climate breakdown. Uh, so what happens, as, as many of you know, is that uh, when, uh, with, the, with the warming uh, uh, of the oceans and the acidifying of the oceans, it uh, has the effect of, of coral bleaching. Um, 
So the great coral rampards depend for their renewal on an elaborate alliance between invertebrate animals and algae, tiny tentacled coral polyps, host algae, that possess an indispensable power, photosynthesis, that the coral lacks. So the algae feeds the polyps, freeing them to secrete calcium carbonate, which as new coral replaces old, builds limestone deposits. The coral in turn provides the algae with carbon dioxide, completing the symbiosis. To survive a living reef must incessantly rebuild in this collaborative manner to counter the corrosive effects of pummeling waves, predatory fish and boring worms. But our failure to contain CO2 emissions is now stressing the animal algae partnership. More acidic and warmer waters prompt the coral host to evict its algae tenants thus starving itself of nutrients and terminating the system's replenishment. The result, a ghosted underwater mortuary of bleached reefs. So we've talked about the ghosted mortuary of the uh, history of the slave trade. Uh, and this is a second kind of ghosted mortuary, uh, the ghosted mortuary of the bleached reefs, where um, runaway climate change has uh, sundered or broken the symbiosis, this collaboration. So the theme of collaboration that we've talked about today uh, exists on two fronts. It exists between the artist and the coral uh, that uh, um, uh, are, are, are together providing or creating this kind of uh, composite artwork, but also the collaboration between uh, the invertebrate animals and the algae that um, are constitutive of the coral reef. This is also a pragmatic side to his artificial reefs. They help create regenerative nurseries for fish and they deflect some of the underwater tourism around, away from fragile coral reefs. Uh, so uh, these, these kind of underwater museums of statuary uh, become a an alternative tourist attraction that takes some of the pressure off the reefs. Uh, this is one example of um, a repurposed car that was turned into a, um, a, a nursery for lobsters and various fish species. This is from a series of vicissitudes. Um, you know, it gives an, an example of the extraordinary transformative uh, impact of marine life occupying these statues. And it reminded me of this quote from the, the geographer Nigel Clark, to be vulnerable to otherness is not just to be open to being unmade, but to being remade into something other than what we are to being propelled in new and unforeseeable directions. Um, rock your mind. Um, again, we see the, this, this paradox that the statuary is static. It's not moving and yet it is constantly being uh, transformed. We have the morphing of the, the geochemistry of the statuary. I think it's a particularly tender image of the, uh, the, the, the forehead of the man leaning against uh, the forehead of, of, the, of the rock, um, a blurring of biological and geological boundaries, um, the tenderness, in a sense, of new life forms. So here's a kneeling, imploring, statue that has been uh, become a uh, has been colonized by these these corals uh, these uh, giving the figure kind of diaphanous um, angelic wings uh, and so uh, the, the it, it creates an unexpected or it adds an unexpected dimension to the mood of the figure In a different vein, Man on Fire, um, clearly an allusion to Burning Man and also an allusion to the paradox of 
uh, planet burning up from a perspective of underwater um, uh, and a sense of perhaps of humanity's self-immolation uh, uh, and the the corals that have attached themselves to his body almost uh, look as if they're impaling him as if he's been penetrated by by arrows there's a there's a suffering aspect to his face so with accelerated uh, with the accelerated anthropogenic impacts on earth's life systems what we have is what scientists have been calling um, chance ecologies, novel ecologies, emergent ecologies, transitional ecologies, new ecosystems uh, emerging at high speed, uh, uh, at least in biological terms, high speed across the earth. Okay. Um, so in this sense, sor uh, coral becomes both the subject of this, these, these statues, but also the material uh, that is being used to supplement his, uh, his original uh, designs. The Last Supper, there, there are many ways you could read this. Um, in the New Testament narrative, after the Last Supper, Jesus is betrayed. So perhaps he has in mind here connecting to the theme of intergenerational betrayal, the betrayal of the future. Of course, also, there is the plight of the oceans themselves, uh, the threat to coral reefs uh, as vital nurseries for fish and other marine life, the um, overfishing from, from industrialization of fishing, and the depletion of uh, the ocean as a resource. Yeah, in an unexpected way, the, the figures are almost uh, um, swaddled, uh, clothed for winter. And just as he uses the, the, the snorkelers to create a, a tension in the mood uh, of some of his works, so too the fish serendipitously move in and out of the statuary, creating this tension between the idea of a, of a sort of a, a rich, mobile, teeming underworld with the, the pain and suffering of the, the people, the immobile uh, statues. The cissitudes, um, both, as I say, both the, the coral and the fish become, in a sense, active uh, participants in this uh, performance art. Uh, so in this series of inertia, one gets a sense of him uh, alluding to the political inertia around uh, action against uh, climate breakdown, uh, a, a sense of a stupefaction of the man with his, his, his dinner and his TV. But even Inertia itself is subject to change. So it becomes encrusted with time. Uh, inertia, in other words, is dynamic. He is kind of turning to stone and the TV is being uh, transformed and obscured by vivid living coral. Thinking about these artworks uh, brought to mind a comment by the actor Wendell Pierce, who said, art doesn't give us life's answers as much as it gives us the power to live life's questions. And I think this is precisely what this underwater art is doing. So I wanted to end with this powerful painting by the Haitian American artist, Edouard duval Carrier. And Dambala Lapoix is an image that calls to mind both um, the preservation of, uh, of, bio, bio, of biological life, of the ecosystem carried over in the boat, but also reminds us of the straddling of the ocean and implicitly the, the, 
the tension in the, uh, the, the movement of the violent movement of enslaved peoples across the ocean uh, over time. So, but, but the figure here is upholding the tree and the boat in an act of transport and stewardship as I read it. So what are the lecture expectations and ability to discuss immigration and inundation, these, these dead metaphors, um, as historical experience and trope with reference to Muhammad Nasheed, Nasheed and Dekeris Taylor? Uh, I'd like you to think about Jason Dekeris Taylor's images in relation to the Anthropocene, displacement and climate change. And I'd like you to focus on two or three images that, that speak to you in particular. Um, how has he used coral as a subject and a medium? And then finally, to come back to my opening remarks, to think about the seabed as a biological, political, and theatrical space in this work. Uh, the, how, how does the seabed become an artistic stage? And what qualities does the seabed offer the artist? Thank you very much. I'll leave it there.